Welcome to the newest episode of Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. I'm your host, Jason Fraley, picking the brains of the top filmmakers, musicians, and artists of our time. 20 years ago, Richard Linklater began filming his movie masterpiece, Boyhood, shooting scenes every year for 12 years for a literal coming-of-age story. I spoke to Link later when the film was released in 2014, en route to six Oscar nominations, as well as Golden Globe wins for Best Picture and Best Director. People throw around the phrase one of a kind a lot, but mm -hmm. seriously, there's no other movie that I can even imagine that's like it. I mean, you have the Year Before trilogy, mm -hmm. which is kind of a similar concept of the, you know, incremental thing, yeah, but, but it's way, yeah. No, nah, it's a different thing. Exactly. So, but with that trilogy and this, you seem very fascinated with just the concept of time. What is it about the notion of time that really, you know, gets you going and, and the whole, oh. this notion of creating a time capsule? I guess I think I spend most of my time not thinking about time, but kind of thinking of storytelling and what to try to capture in a story. And I think I keep coming back to the notion of like how life really feels or how we process time or, and our experiences and things. I didn't really have a great moment of childhood to, to portray here, but I did have a feeling of growing up and then parenting I was trying to express. And I couldn't really pick my spot. So I had this idea to film a little bit of it every year that it would kind of create this portrait of, I thought that would be a powerful document of someone, of, of this whole family, the kids growing up, the parents aging, and it had such storytelling possibilities that, that it would have this cumulative effect, these kind of rather intimate moments over time would mean something because it does in all our own lives. I mean, any of us think yeah. of our own life. It's yeah. a lot of little stuff, but it adds up to now and to you and to me and, you know, it's a big deal for the person in possession of all that history you know so I, I was hoping to I thought there was a way to get an audience into that in an intimate environment how do you so, go about how do you go yeah. about writing it in terms of because uh -huh. I mean past things you've written it's more you know like Days and Confused is like an American graffiti type like smaller in a smaller window yeah one night. How, yeah so how do you and then this is the complete opposite yeah so did you have did you write the whole script you have it kind of outlined and then you would no. rewrite each segment Big outline, big plan, big trajectory of all the characters. But to really maximize this methodology, um, it was important to spend that year, each year, thinking about it. You know, that would be foolish to have that opportunity. Because most films, you just want to back off and think more. Right. When you're in production, right. it's a sprint. Yeah. And you kind of want it to, like, I'd love to <laughs> just have a day to look at my footage and feel yeah. my way through this element of the film. Right. And you don't get that. You're boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So this was, was that, film three yeah. or four days and then think for a year and edit and <laughs> yeah. this flowing thing. So I was able to think for that year and think about whatever grade Mason was in or what was going on in their lives. And I got to slowly, as they all aged a year, you know, and grew up, I could kind of bend the film a little bit in their right. direction, whatever's going on with them, how things are going, what they're thinking about their characters. So it's this kind of ongoing collaboration with not only my cast, but like time, you know, what the, yeah. what, what's going on in the culture, everything. So it was sort of a year to year process. Did you think of any of the potential, with something so ambitious over so long a time, did you think of any potential downfalls? Like so many things could have gone wrong in that period where, yeah. you know, maybe one, the parents no longer want this one kid to be a part of it sure. or whatever, you know, yeah. how do you, or you just, just say, this is my vision and we yeah. go. Yeah, I, I never allowed my mind to go too far in that direction because I, I looked at it the other way. I mean, yeah, you can go, well, here's all the pitfalls. And, right. you know, you acknowledge them and go, well, sure. But right. they're not any, it's, ultimately, it's no different than life. For sure. Yeah. We could all get unlucky right. this afternoon. Hit by a bus tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. We could all get a phone call right. that would change our life pretty dramatically. Anything can happen. and But it usually doesn't. The, the big things happen, you know, rarely. So I proceeded with, well, all those unknowns... And it is a, you're collaborating with an unknown here, the future, a right. random unknown future that we all collaborate in life. But I, I looked at that as a positive, like, oh, that'll be fun. I like the idea of not totally knowing. Right. Like, what knows what the culture will be doing? What knows what right. new music or, or how my kid, these kids will grow up? Right. You know, how, you know it, it was more of a positive approach to the unknown. Yeah, and, and your, your daughter is one of the, is the sister. Yeah. Right? So did you did it did it seem like a cool thing from the start where, where I'm going to chronicle my daughter, but I can't make her the main character. But, it, you know, how did that factor in? It's almost no, like a whole, weird I didn't, whole movies. I didn't <laughs> conceive it with her in mind. Okay. 
even though she had been in movies and been around movie sets her whole life, she had known right. Ethan her whole life, you know, typical. But I, I think she sort of cast herself. She knew, once she knew there was an older sister part kind of in her age range, it just made my life a lot easier to <laughs> cast her. Because A, she wanted, the, she right. want, just assumed she would do it. Yeah, yeah. And, which is a good sign, you know, right. she wanted to do it. And it was, I, I knew where she'd be every year. Right. You know, there's one less volatile thing in the mix that could do, you know, cause problems. Right down the way and what's it like working with her where you have your own father daughter thing versus with the it the was boy? fun i mean what's the secret to working with kids yeah it was well first it was similar to both of them i just treated them both just because she's my daughter it was it was just fun for us yeah. it was just a fun thing we did a few days a year some kids go with their dad to six flags we shot a movie a few days a year you take know, your it wasn't, child to work day <laughs> yeah it wasn't that big a deal she always liked it i mean there was a she, there was a little moment somewhere along the way she asked if, if her character could die but <laughs> I was like, no, that's a little dramatic, a little dramatic for what we're trying to do here. But yeah. she, uh, she was always, she was fun to work with the whole way. Now, when you say a little dramatic, one of the things I liked about Boyhood mm -hmm. is you almost painstakingly resist the urge to have those dramatic things happen. Like, a, yeah. you know, it's more of a, you know, these little life moments that are intimate, but when you take a step back in, the, in their totality, it, it really adds up to mm -hmm. something. Um, for example, the scene where they're having the party in the basement and they're throwing the blade, at the saw yeah. blade. Like when the guy's about ready to karate chop the board, is he gonna fly back into it? And you're, you know. resist those urges. How? What? How? Do, you you know, know, how that, does that go? That's into? a good example of how conditioned audiences right. are because right. it never crossed my mind shooting that's that. That's funny. That's funny. I didn't right even there. notice the blade was behind his head. Right. The way the audiences do. I wasn't looking for that. That was never what the scene <laughs> was gonna be about because I was at that right. camp out. We threw blades and no one yeah. lost a little finger or no yeah. one caught one in the jugular. You know, it just, you get through childhood. Most of the bad shit doesn't happen. Yeah. But uh, you see how people expect it or like, oh, don't drive in text. And then he's, yeah. she shows him the thing while he's right. driving. Like, okay, that's where the right. car, you know. Well, the Sopranos are going to run off the road. With yeah, 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 you know, it's going to happen because, yeah. you know, we go to movies and we right. see things for, to see the extraordinary, yeah. the things we don't see in our regular lives. Right. So was your goal you then know, to so. capture those ordinary? Yeah, like yeah. Like those little tree of life moments, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, the whole movie was this collection of little intimate uh, moments. But, you know, but again, it's not that they're not dramatic. Because once you're in the kid's point of view, it is dramatic. Yeah. Being the new kid in school, that's, yeah. that's like almost traumatic, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it's little. And the big, you know, it's easy for parents to say, oh, you know, you got a new classmate. Go right. make some friends. I'll see you later. I've got... But for the kid, it's a big deal. You know, you have to yeah. remember how big a deal some of this stuff is. So I didn't think it lacked for drama. It was just the scale of what's realistic to that age. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it definitely doesn't lack for drama. I mean, it runs almost three hours and you're into it the whole yeah, way without, quote unquote, things happening. And you're yeah. still into it the yeah, whole that's way. That's the, the big achievement. Yeah, that's the, I think, the thing people wouldn't have predicted. But I really felt that if we could be honest with an audience and and let them into this family life in a in a realistic way and we didn't have a bunch of trumped up plotty goofy things right. that you would accept it as real and actually care about them and right. see yourself in it in some depending on your age and your experience you know different angles you know you would have to see their perspectives i guess now talk about and i think what kind of keeps it dramatic is the series and layers of different time capsule things so yeah, you have the, you know, watching the, the people grow up and, and, you know, from scene to scene and watching their haircuts change and their body size change and age and all that. But um, let's go through a couple of them one by one. Mm -hmm. The technology. You're yeah. capturing it in real time. So you're, it's not like you, you're going back in time and saying, oh, I'm going to plant that yeah. Xbox in that scene. It's You're capturing it in that year. That year. So and it goes from a Game Boy to an iPod to Facebook to, yeah, the to Wii. the Wii. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you as a director slash writer look for those moments and insert them well, year to year? Technology is pretty easy because yeah. especially in this age, that's all that changes. It's amazing what doesn't change in the culture. But... Technology you can count on, but you know, still you have to have a, an eye for it. I didn't want to foreground it too much. I just knew, I remember the second year he's in the classroom. I said, oh, that little iMac, the little triangle. Yeah. I said, that's not long for this world. I, I kind of put that in profile knowing that would be like, oh, that old computer. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was just kind of fun. It was sort of the fun backdrop, but it, it was, I knew that would kind of demarcate a time and yeah. a place for any kid like the way it did Eller I was like well what games are you playing right. 
Yeah, is that your favorite? You're watching Dragon Ball Z? Cool. It's a movie, yeah. You're playing that game? Seems real to me. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's like, and then, you know, yeah. that plus 10 years equals, oh, shit, I remember that. Yeah. You know, so same with, like with music. It's like, oh, I remember that song. Well, let's talk about the music. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Days and Confused is one of the greatest soundtracks ever in mm-hmm. my mind. You, and then, you know, School of Rocks, so you, you're a music guy. How did you go about selecting that for each individual snippet? Because we go from what, like, you know, Gerald Crow to Arcade Fire by the end. and you Yeah, know, so- well, it runs the gamut and different kind of perspectives. And it depends on who's listening to the who. Right. Who runs the boombox? You know whose whose music it is. You know, if Ethan, he's listening to Dylan and Wilco, Wilco, yeah. and yeah. you know stuff like that. Uh, Patricia at that moment's listening to Cheryl Crow. You know, whatever's. And then I I told Eller because he was no help in this regard because I don't. You know, dazed. You brought up that. That's like music. I can give write a narrative to every song right. of where I was and right. what. You know, boom, I was there. Soundtrack. But I'm that. not there yeah. for for. Right. For this era, I'm an old man right. in comparison to, you know. Right. So I, I, it was fun because I researched and went through a lot of music and I picked songs I liked. And then I had uh, some consultants, a little bit older than Eller, write narratives about like, oh, I hated this song, but everyone listened to it. Or my <laughs> older sister, li- you know, right. so I, I heard personal things okay. like even the song at the end by Family of the Year, Hero, a guy around the editing room with it interns he was like yeah i just broke up with my girlfriend i was feeling really bad and i heard that song and it just made me feel like everything was gonna be okay, okay. i'm like oh see that's There's beautiful that's yeah. beautiful to yeah. me if one person experienced that right then it that meant right. something to me i didn't want any there's no song that someone didn't have a reaction to but it's coming from all directions sure. i just wanted it to be you know representational right. in some way of the time yeah um and then speaking of music one of the cool self-referential things that i thought um and please let me know if it's intentional. I Uh-oh. Beatles thing, right? When Ethan Hawke makes the compilation. And, yeah, yeah. And, like and, he, and he says, all right, Paul's going to bring us to the party. We see the party scene. George <laughs> is going to talk about God. We see the church scene. John's going to, what does he say? It's all about love and love pain. And we, get, we get the relationship and the breakup. Mm-hmm. And then Ringo just says, hey, what are we worried about? Let's just Can all, we all just yeah, enjoy we'll, it while, enjoy we have while we're it. here. And that's the end. Yeah. Dude, was that intentional? For like the last third of the movie follows <laughs> that quote. That, those four it did. Beatle things. Was that things? intentional? Not really. Because it's no, exactly. No, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> if you check, I mean, you're probably tired of watching it, but see, I think you were subconsciously yeah. playing it out. Well, the way. Beatles, man, they're everywhere. Yeah. Beatles are God. They are kind of, they <laughs> they're are. They're that presence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's really funny. No, that's great. But that's your subconscious uh, gift to us. Well, all those things are important, let's mm. say. It's not yeah. totally a synchronistic, right. random thing. I mean, those four things are kind of general. Yeah. And they're, you know, right. important phases of life and yeah. all in their own way. So it's not completely, un, you know. I just thought it was cool that yeah, it, went, it's cool. it went that way. I'm not saying it's anything but cool, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, and then, uh, all right, yeah, so we've got technology, music, the people growing, and then also history and politics. We have news footage of Fallujah and the war in Iraq, and then that all these years moment, later, you're yeah. like, we're still there, and we're going back there. And, yeah, to... The beauty of this, I mean, we're doing a period piece in real time, so we don't know. Right. We don't know the future. We started post 9 11 pre invasion, was our first yeah. year, 02. We don't know what's happening. By the time we're filming that next thing, it's like, oh, things have gotten ugly yeah. over there. Um, but by the end of this movie, it could, you know, he could have been waiting on his draft number, you know, if the right. country went a different way. You don't know. Yeah. But you see the effects, and it's, I tried to capture it from the kid's point of view, like, I grew up in the Vietnam era, so when I was that age, it was like the war was just on TV. Oh, and, you know, in Laos and Cambodia today, yeah. and it meant nothing to me. I mean, it was just the, the backdrop. Right. To your childhood. Seemed, seemed yeah. the way life was. There were, I had friends, dads, and brothers, and there was a guy in our apartment complex, a vet who had come back kind of disturbed, and, you know, so I thought, well, you yeah, know, they were around. They were in college. They were back in school. My mom taught some vets. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And here we are again, a, a kind of a war that goes on forever. Right. But again, from the kid's point of view, he doesn't really have the politics of it. They right. don't really understand it, but it's there. And you pick up on your parents' politics. Like I always knew the who scene, my parents yeah. were for, right. but I didn't know the reasoning. Like, oh, you know, dad was for Carter. Right. You know, I remember I had a stepfather at the moment for Nixon, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I just remember those elections. I thought that's something they would remember, but it's not. And I thought even if Obama didn't win in 08, that would have been an interesting, you know, it was an interesting yeah. moment. There was a lot of excitement. Yeah. And uh, that would be something you'd remember. Did you, know, you feel like, a responsibility? It's almost, it's 
the opposite of Mad Men when they can comment on what happened in this decade. Did you feel yeah. a responsibility to capture it in real time? Or it was just kind of the backdrop? Yeah, it was all kind of backdrop. Like the foreground is your own life. Again, from a kid, you're pretty self-absorbed, unless it's affecting you directly. So it's, it's more general. But I don't know about responsibility. I mean, I certainly wanted to be thoughtful. Yeah. You know, but it was mainly how it, what impressions it would leave. I didn't have any big points to make. I mean, Ethan's character, you know, clearly his politics are on his sleeve there a little bit. And What's it like working with him Ethan. again? He's, he's a go-to for you. And, and even Patricia yeah, in we, Fast Food Nation. So yeah, you yeah, return we all, to the same cast. You know, Eller's in Fast Food Nation, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, they were all in that. And uh, Do you, Is it just because yeah, you're like comfortable family. working with them? Or is it like well, you're Ethan is like, on tour? No, sidekick? Ethan is a, he's a... He's just such a uh, great, I think he's just a really substantial artist, you know. He always has been. I met him when he was 23. He had written a book. He had directed a short movie. He had a hit music video. He was one of the top actors in Hollywood. You know, had his own theater company. You know, all that at 23. Yeah. You know, so he was the real deal then. But he had, oh, but he's a good-looking leading man, so no one takes any of that serious. But 20 years later, he's still all those things. And a dad. He's got four kids. You know, he's, he's, it's a, he's got a lot to offer, and I've seen a lot of his theater work, plays he's directed and, you know, been in. And, I don't know. He's the kind of guy who pushes you. That's what I yeah. like about Ethan. He's not like, oh, we've done this a lot. Let's just phone this one in and have fun. Ethan's on the phone to you at 2 in the morning saying, hey, I, you know, what about this? I've been thinking about that. And then, you know, even as you get toward the finish line, the, the last scene where him and Mason, Mason Sr. and Jr. at the bar, yeah. old roommates playing. So, you know, that seems, what are we going to talk about in that scene? That's kind of a big moment. It's the last time we see, and, you know, I was kind of going like, well, let's talk a bit about breakup. And he's like, well, why'd you do the film? And he'd look at me and he's like, why'd you, why'd you make the film? What are you trying to convey? Directing the director. <laughs> or just, just challenging, you know, yeah. in a good way. Yeah. It's just like, well, what are we trying to say here? You know, it's like, right. well, I'll tell you what I'm trying to say. Okay, well, that's interesting. You know, you know, just like it's Pushing a great, back yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what a collaborator is. Uh -huh. You push each other, and you get to a place neither of you could have got to alone. Exactly. And Ethan and I, we've always had that relationship in like everything we do. So I, I like that. I have that with most people I work with. He's just a, it's just work out that. <laughs> You know, 20 years ago, we were working together for the first time in Vienna on Before Sunrise. And at the end, people asked, well, are you guys ever going to work together again? We kind of looked at each other. Well, I hope so. I have no idea. You know, you don't know how any of this. One of my only regrets is there's so many actors I enjoy working with. And it just, the planets have to align for you to work mm -hmm. together again. You know, it has to kind of, right. it's timing and any Schedule. number of things. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, in terms of the, you know, it seems like a lot of this, if not straight autobiographical, at least like you're drawing on what it was like to grow up in this coming of age thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought a really powerful scene that kind of said a lot was was the dark room scene. Yeah. Um, was that based on a specific mentor of yours? I had or? A several. Like a lot of people said, uh, you know, I remember that scene. I remember mm -hmm. someone pulling me aside, but we we all had that where that older person who kind of pulls you aside, and they sort of kick you in the butt. They give you some compliments, and whether it was a coach or had a you know a high school teacher who kind of did that, a couple coaches, and said, hey, listen, here's what you are, but here's where you have to get to. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of nice, because the, the, the fact is people are always throwing shit at you like that when you're a kid. It's just when do you want to listen. Right. You know, you usually don't hear it. You know, all, there's people in your face your whole life trying to manipulate you. Yeah. And, and mold you into who knows what. Right. You just wish they would shut up. The movie is just, everyone's in your face all the time. But I think at that very moment, it's something he kind of needs and wants to hear. He's about ready his own. for it at that point. Yeah, at that yeah. moment, he's receptive. Yeah. It's always there, but he's receptive at that moment. Just that little thing about, hey, you know, you got some talent, but so what? You know, you've got a, all this other stuff. So it's just that thing a kid should hear. And I think the exact line is, Anyone can take pictures, but art that special. Yeah. What can you bring to it that nobody else can? So yeah. put yourself in that dark room. What is it that you br that you bring that's, to it? That's me asking myself at that age, or any what I would ask anybody when someone's, mm -hmm. oh, I want to be a screenwriter, I want to be an actor. That's what I would ask. Mm -hmm. Well, what what's unique about you? You know, what do you have? And we all have that. It's like, well, it's your own life. It's your the depth of your perception of your own experience is all you really have. 
But if you don't value your own experience, your own perceptions, then you kind of have nothing. So I put it back on the individual, like, oh, you want to write some of my favorite writers and artists, they're really just dealing with, you know, they're not way out there. I mean, that's, that's beautiful, too, the, the great imaginative people right. who can go far outside themselves. But the ones who can really dig in to the self and, you know, that can be important or, or that can be a great communication. So I, I challenge people usually along those lines. You know, it took me all the years to figure out. I think it's a great moment when you realize what's going on in your own head could be subject matter. You know, because we're taught to believe, okay, well, you're just you, but here are the great things. So how do I get from here to there? And you realize, oh, it's actually in front of me. You know, if I could just dig into this unique little experience I'm having being alive, I can communicate that. You know, like when a writer realizes the voices he's hearing can be the subject matter. Right. You know, like that's the personal work. When Kerouac realizes he and his friends' lives, driving around the country, hitchhiking and drinking, doing, you know, going to jazz bars, that's, that's the it. subject that's of a, that yeah. means something. Mm-hmm. You got to see, you got to see what's in front of you in a kind of a metaphorical way. Like, that's how I started seeing everything. It's like, well, this is this, but it, it means something else. Right. It means something greater. Thanks so much for joining us on Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. Remember to hit the subscribe button and give us a five-star rating if you like what you hear. We'll see you next time. I wanted to take a second to tell you about an app I really enjoy. Living in the D.C. area is great, and Podcast D.C. gathers all of the local shows that I like all in one local app. Health, sports, local news, politics, and so much more. Podcast D.C. is the new local app with hundreds of D.C. area podcasts to choose from. I can earn exciting rewards just for listening and share the podcasts I love instantly. Available in the App Store or in Google Play, listen local with Podcast D.C.